COVID is a good reflection of what your retirement is going to be. Because in your retirement, you're going to have a lot of time and limited income streams. That is what this COVID situation is doing. You will have a lot of time, no income stream. So reflect. But also there are opportunities around this COVID. There are some expenses you are not incurring. You're, some of you are not incurring transport. I'm not incurring transport myself. That money, where is it going? Let's, let's reflect on, on, on the opportunities and see, and let them count. Because there's one, it's a colleague of mine, when I, one time when I was bragging that I don't drink, I don't go to the bar, they asked me that if I, I get the same salary as you, I go to the bar, now I want you to show me the money that you do not take to the bar. Where is it? So it is not enough for you to, to have a good habit, but let it count. So I could not go, maybe I'm not going to the bar, but I'm not also saving that money. So if you are saving transport, if you are saving money from the bar, let it count. Let that count and protect it jealously. And then, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would need us, it's, it's, an, it's an appeal. I would need us to take responsibility of our statuses. I quote from the president's speech, if you are poor before COVID, it is not COVID that has made you poor. Everyone right now is using COVID as a scapegoat and saying, for their responsibilities, many people are not paying school fees and saying because of COVID, but school had set it before COVID. So what do we as NSSF, a, the financial literacy department what, what unit, what we want to do for you is, let's have a conversation. We have an individual conversation. Quit these things of talking to money. No, everyone has individual. Let's talk. Whatever age you are, whatever stage you are in employment, come, let's give us a call. Let's, we have over, over 200 of our staff have been trained in, the, in assisting you through your financial planning. Uh, but we also, we don't do this. We also, we shall, we, shall, we shall link you up with our partners, Bank of Uganda, Industrial Research Institute. We shall link you with Microfinance Support Center. For each of those, your problems, we believe there is a partner out there that can provide a solution. Because we do not think your, your, the solution lies in you taking your NSSF money. But we're also not going to leave you hanging. If you have a problem right now as NSSF, Let's talk. Come, let's talk, and let's find a solution together. Let's talk to the bank. We, we've, we've, we've had people with mortgage issues, and we've talked to the bankers together as partners, not, not, not that we are guaranteeing anyone, but we've, some people are just fearing to go and talk, and, uh, to talk to their bankers. Let's talk. There, there is a whole deep unit set up to do that, and there is a whole 200 people, uh, other staff who have been trained to assist you through this. So ladies and gentlemen, I beg that to remind you that growing up is optional. Let's exhibit grown up. Uh, let, let's let's not just grow old, but let's also let's let's grow up. Allow me to submit that as my presentation, and uh, I'll refer to the question of there is a question that will come. The global inf impact of access. Uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a, an official statement that has been issued by the MD. Uh, there is also an official statement that has been issued by UBRA. And the matter is now with parliament. In that, uh, probably in the next seven days, it will be presented on the floor. I can't discuss much about that. But that, those, those two documents will also help guide you around, these, uh, around what we feel. Ours is what... We, it's just advisory, but government is the one is, is sets the laws, uh, presents the laws, and parliament makes them. So we'll wait to hear what comes out of it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Apollo, for that. Uh, you have quite some a number of questions that have come through. I'll run through some of them quickly. Uh, this one comes from Paddy says, um, Apollo, why does NSSF keep members' money for a full year, uh, not earning interest? The unit trusts with other investment management houses compound the savings as soon as you invest. So open up NSSF and let members decide where to invest. Now, um, I'll just take two, then you respond. Uh, the second one comes from Monica. 
Have you thought about allowing contributors to use their savings as security for mortgages? Many people get their money at 55 years, then they start to build houses. When they are old, kids have gone away. Many people are highly indebted to these productive years. Can you comment to those quickly? Uh, that, the last one with, from Monica, that's one of the things actually we are saying. Why are you picking your NSSF money and building a huge house when your kids have left? It is, it is, it's, it's, it's something that almost 30% of our claimants do, and it's, it doesn't make it right. And that, what we are saying is, let's talk to these people. While, while everyone is getting money at NSSF, we give them a chance to, let's talk to you and let's, 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 let's find purpose around you. We, are not, we can't direct how you use your money, but let's give you options. But we don't want to do this at 55. Let's do it when you are still young. Start creating that uh, options when you're still young. So, we can only talk, but final thing let's rest with you. For the issue of mortgages and other products, midterm access, maternity, medical, those are the things that are entailed in the bill. Now, depending on which format it is passed, if the bill is passed and we have the, the, the we have the we've been directed to do to do mortgages, uh, guaranteeing mortgages, it will be done. But it's one of the proposals that was in the bill. Let people use the NSS of money to use as for mortgages. So it is definitely okay. going to be. Okay, um, thank you. Account, then there's a quick um, one here. Yes, please. Yes, there's a quick one here. I think someone wants, this is Simon Peter seeking some clarity from you, Apollo, that uh, yes, I please. hope you're able to provide some clarity on what you mean by early access. Are you referring to access contrary to plan rules? Is it possible? What are the products are you referring to in this category? If the plan rules or policies process early access, I think you need to provide some clarity about that. Uh, the early access, there, what, what, there have been proposals around, can we access our money after 10 years of saving? Can we access our money after at 45? Can we access some of it? This, <clears throat> there's, there's been quite a varied, varied proposals. Right now, there is a consolidated, the, the finance and gender committees are, are, are consolidating all that. And one of the proposals is, can you enable the board come up with products that's that, that that every time every time we need to come up with a product, we don't need to go to the parliament. Every time NSF needs to have a product, maybe out of what the members are saying, they don't need to go back to parliament. Uh, so I can't I, I can't now tell you that this is what is going to come out. I, we can only wait. It's about in seven days and see which format does what and what exactly does it mean. But there have been varied, varied proposals. People have made quite a number of proposals. Others have gone to committees. Others have gone to their MPs. And we are waiting to see exactly what, what form all this comes out with. Don't, okay, I, that, I, is I, with I respect to, that is with respect to NSSF. Maybe I try to address the retirement scheme people that are here. If I, mm -hmm. because remember retirement is, retirement benefits are for when I retire. So, if yes. I leave organization A and I'm paid my money and I decide to spend it, you do categorize that as early access, uh, or I am supposed to get this money, eat some, and then invest the rest for my latter years. Quickly comment on that, and then I know we have a lot of questions. Um, members will just ask us to go through. Uh, we'll go through this at the end uh, of the presentation. Just answer that, yes, and then we shall handle the rest. In my opinion, retirement is not, is, is not an age. Retirement is a figure. Uh, you can decide to retire at, 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 at 50. You can decide to retire at, uh, at 70. You can decide to retire. For me, it is, it is how much do I have in the bank? Can I retire? Can I, and retirement is stopping active work. Now, when I leave, like personally, I've just left one institution to join NSSF. I accessed my provident fund. Now, I had not retired. That money was, was, was is supposed to go towards my retirement. Now, I should either be 
they are assuming that I, I, I can either transfer it to the new provident fund or I can invest it in other asset, uh, other asset classes or business that will speak towards my retirement. Retirement money, and maybe people are shy about investing for retirement because thinking they will not live that long. No, you live that long. So for me, retirement money, anytime you access it, it needs to go into that product that will give you money when all the other incomes stop coming through. Okay. All right, thank you, Apollo. Quite a number of questions for you. Hang in there. At the end, you'll get all of them that are due to you. Uh, at this juncture, I'd like to invite my colleague, Lydia, to take us through the next session. Uh, Lydia, you're on mute. Yes. Sorry, I've just unmuted. I trust that you can all hear me now. Yes. Good morning. Yes, I would like to thank our audience for always um, tuning in and staying with us. And I can actually see that you are mm -hmm. actually active and you're lively and you've asked Mr. Apollo quite a number of questions. And um, I'd also like to ask you a question because we have talk time for grabs and I'd like to ask you a question and for the first three people to hit the raise hand button and answer the question correctly, you get to get some airtime for, for yourself. So I'm going to ask, um, for how long has Enwealth Uganda been in operation? The first three people to raise their hands. Panelists are not allowed to participate and also Enwealth staff not allowed to participate, just for our audience. Okay, I see Amani, Deborah, and Albert have unmuted your speakers. Please uh, attempt to answer the question. Uh, one year, uh -huh. coming yeah. to one year now. Okay, thank you, Amani. Yes, actively one year now. Okay. okay. Albert? Albert, are you there? Okay, I'll allow Frederick to attempt. Um, Bansi, I think Albert commented on the panelist box. Oh, he said okay. one year now. Okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you so much. You're going to drop your numbers in the panelist chat box and or the Q&A um, section and then we will get back to you. You you have your airtime. Thank you so much. See um, you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, for that. Mm. All right, thank you, Lydia. It's time for our next speaker, and our next is uh, Mr. Emmanuel Mwaka. He's the CEO at ICA Life Assurance Company and Executive Director at ICA Asset Management Limited. He has over 10 years of experience in insurance, pension, finance, and audit sectors. He chairs the Life and Pension Committee at the Uganda Insurance Association. He holds a bachelor's degree in development economics from Mackay University and is currently pursuing an MBA from Edinburgh um, Business School, amongst other professional pursuits. Uh, Emmanuel, you're welcome to take us through the impact of value and investments. Thank you. Um, I think we're having an issue accessing uh, Mr. Emmanuel. 
I think we can go ahead to Rosemary, then come back to him, if that is okay. No. All right, so let's have Rosemary then. Just a quick uh, is there an in a simple but in the sub Saharan Africa. She's a member of the Committee of Actuaries for the United Nations Joint Staff Pension Fund, a member of the Actuarial Uganda Investment and currently works with Cal. Welcome. Good. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. My name is Rosemary Nantambi Amiri. I work with Culland Consulting Limited, which is an actuarial firm that is based out of England. We have carried out actuary evaluations within East Africa and within the region, Sub Saharan Africa, and we've been in the business since the 1970s. So we've been talking about finances and financial plans and talking about retirement for a very long time. Uh, the topic that I was asked to talk about is financial planning. It's a very wide topic and something that's difficult to, to dive deep into on a webinar, but then I'll try and do the best that I can. I've only been given a speak, so I'm so I have a financial a financial goes with a thorough evaluation of individuals in future stage. It is defined as a document containing a person's current situation and long-term monetary goals, as well as strategies to achieve these goals. It can be created independently or with the help of an advisor. A personal financial plan is an ongoing process that should help you your stress on about money, support your current financial needs, help you build a nest egg for your future, for long-term goals, and even short-term goals like personal debt, uh, rent, you know, school fees, etc. It helps you plan for unknown future shocks like deaths, even the current pandemic. Um, I'll get to the pandemic after this and what its effect is on our financial plans. It's important because it helps you make the most of your assets and it helps you meet your future goals. So there are two types of financial plans. There are short-term and long-term plans. Short-term plans involve and speaking easily more predictable in the short term. So you can see where things are going in the shorter term. And they're easily amendable. You can change it on a, you know, but long-term plans are normally invested in long-term assets, of course. So they're not easy to change in a short term frame. Short-term financial plans usually invest in short-lived assets and securities, or you know, or securities, and it normally. Financial plans can include setting up an emergency fund for you know unknown things, you know, planning for a wedding, uh, planning to travel, holidays, home improvements, you know, school insurance loans, debt payments, etc. Long-term plans usually are longer than one year and they involve more uncertainty because of course market trends are not in the long term. Who can imagine what where we'll be now? You know, who ever thought that we'd be in, in the current crisis that we're in right now? So many factors can affect your investments, regardless of, of the investments being property. You know, like in Uganda, we invest a lot in land, in, in buildings, in, in, in property, personal property, rental income, etc. We talk about passive income, rental income. But then there, there, there are certain things that you never thought would ever happen. Whoever thought that Lake Victoria would flood the way it is flooded right now, you know? So on the other hand, planning for long term is necessary in order to enjoy financial security in retirement. So while, whilst it is, it's important, we have to also be flexible enough to account for the, for the uncertainty that is inherent. So long-term financial planning combines financial forecasting with strategizing 
It's a highly collaborative process that has future scenarios and helps individuals navigate challenges. Examples of personal long-term financial planning include retirement funds, uh, planning to pay off a mortgage because mortgage is usually in 20 years, starting a business, saving for university fees, hopefully you begin to save when the chance, when the chance, you know, is begins, it all And does this plan such as medical expenses and long-term care? Does medical provide as a decision that need a right to manage your estate upon you? Do you have provisions in place to protect yourself and your assets? For example, do you have insurance? I mean, your car insurance for your assets? all the properties that you're buying? Have you sat down with your family or other trusted people to discuss how you've done your financial planning? Have you shared your financial plan with your family members? To affect it in case, even if you're just sick and you don't care, they'll need to be a box to this. So now a reality of the pandemic continues to unfold. Don't let it render hard. In the weeks and months ahead, plan, use the time to prepare for your life after COVID-19. Maybe you can consider the, the document. You can consider, as I mentioned earlier, legal documents. Have you assigned someone powers of attorney? Get a report it out now because this is a significant part of your financial plan. This can give the trusted person a chance and ability to pay bills remotely, during medical updates by phone if you're affected, etc. You know, we always think of these in in, in Africa as end documents, but in reality, they are live your life documents. The other thing we need to think about is finances, of course, because it is a financial plan. You know, worst case scenarios, significant, for example, significant market changes, significant medical, medical expenses. Now we've had locusts. Who ever thought locusts would ever be something that we are having to deal with right now? These, of course, as you know, what locusts do, they damage your crops, they have an impact on your budgets, your cash flows, etc. has a eventually impacts you very carefully. Many very carefully laid out plans. And of course, the current biggest shock, which is the global pandemic. The other thing that we need to think about now in this time is this pandemic is a, is a, is a reminder that will stop at nothing to get their hands on your hard hand money. So have you put any protective measures in place in case, say, for example, your bank card goes missing or someone manages to log into your account? Have you put, do you change your passwords, right? Do you take care? Do you, do you, do you put a, a limit on your financial transactions online, you know? And even if they're not online, when you go to the bank, when, so that they, they're able to question if someone makes a big transaction or wants to make a big transaction in your account. So this pandemic is showing us that planning ahead will both gain matters as well as unexpected. Taking the steps now will help you rest assured no matter what happens. You know, four, four categories of people in Uganda, I think. People who earn and save by force where it's managed, plan and save voluntarily and also invest in both long-term and short-term assets. People who earn and do not feel have and who are part of the latent labor force. You saw the percentage from Apollo's presentation was, he said 11% of the labor force is on the contributes to NSSF. What about the other percentage? These are people who could actually put money aside. Maybe they put it aside in other ways. But then the, the, the studies that have been carried out in Uganda is that the latent labor force is, is almost 80% that does not contribute, that does not save. We're all going to slow down. We may even retire. Some people do not retire. They continue working until, you know, they... So Apollo said, we're all going to grow old for sure. But are we going to grow up? You know, not everyone goes to the as they advertise in the movies. No one is, not everyone is going to go to a farm as a plan. Some people are going to retire and have nothing coming in, no income coming in. But the question that we have here is, how do you get an income of sorts? How do you guarantee an income of sorts that replaces your previous income that meets your needs as an older person? The needs of an older person these days still in Uganda because of the informal sector and, the, and, 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 and our position in the world maybe, is that you know, people, even the older people, the grandmothers, are primary caregivers for their grandchildren. And they still look after children and they still pay fees even, and they buy them food and they take care of the grandchildren. So 
have we factored those factors into our retirement planning or our planning, financial planning? This coronavirus poses a threat to many people, many people's health, current financial well-being, and it has the potential to derail your future retirement and financial security permanently. With a steep rise in unemployment, salary cuts, furloughed, furloughed staff, all because of COVID-19, especially in the lower income, menial, service, retail, travel industries, many of the families are by the it's very immediate challenges because of the lack of personal emergency funds. For those who are lucky enough that their employment status does not change, their employer may be the best source to help them in getting financial advice and guidance. Some employers will offer a mix of benefits, physical, emotional, and financial stress. Some will offer counseling. Take up counseling. There is things like tele tele teletherapy. You can call the phone and speak to them and even ask, uh, you know, advisors on the phone and speak to them and they'll probably give you their services at a or even free sometimes and some some employers have actually set up health and wellness programs the fees are going to come. So people come you know and older age. Even now, you know, you don't want to be begging your relatives for food on the table. You need to be starting to probably dig into your savings, no longer employed. But people do not have the discipline of putting money away. Everything is going to have a negative impact on both short-term and long-term security. The market is down, so there'll be a decline in assets. Unemployment is up, so the whole contribution to their plans, put money aside in UEs, you know, et cetera. Or people are even withdrawing those funds. They may be forced up in their savings, but do they have the savings? This is the thing. Do they have a financial plan that includes their saving money? It's like this, you know? Everybody is suffering from this. Of course, people who want to claim their money from NSSF, you know, who are hoping to get their money earlier from NSSF, again, another sensitive issue, who want to claim it before their full rate age, of course, there are less in payments if they, than if they waited. The longer, of course, the benefits after that, after their retirement, their normal full retirement age, the more they'll get. But it's not all doom. The coronavirus hit, has hit the country and it saves us hard. It has hit the world and it saves us. But we're not as, as bubbly and people will bounce back after this health and economic crisis. Just have a, this recession is feared to be a U-shaped recession, which means that recovery could take a longer period. So, 2008-9 recession, which was V-shaped, the, the market, but it gained back approximately 80% of its savings in a few months. So it's all about context. The question is, if you look at yourself, am I worse off than I was two months ago? Of course you are, yes. But is that the way to think about these things? No. The longer term perspective makes sense. Unemployment has gone up, if, if, if incomes have fallen, so expect changes related to retirement planning. So what retirement tips are there for the COVID-19 crisis? Financial professionals preach patience when facing a model doing money for retirement, from retirement accounts after investments have declined in value, simply locks in the losses because we had them value low. The best strategy is to ride out the market volatility, especially if you're not close to retirement and your portfolio will most likely regain value over time. In many cases, big market, big market declines are create opportunities to small and savvy investors. Speak to your financial advisor, because when assets drop in value during a sell-off, it's helpful to think of them as being on sale, you know? So in, stick to your long-term investment philosophy and do not change due to a short-term economic upheaval. For many employees, their employer-sponsored benefits are the only source of outside ad advice. And there's been, as I've said earlier, there's been a lot of investment volatility, but call your financial advisor or call someone who you know knows a bit more Call, you know, Enroll, they'll advise you, you know. So the questions that go through our minds during this time is, will lockdown end? Will life go back to, to, to 
to the way it used to be. You know, will there be a second wave? You know, when they remove the lockdown, will there be a second wave of, of infections and they'll, they'll, they'll even do a longer lockdown? Will there be more relapses during the year, over years? Could the pandemic end in three to six months with the right long-term measures and management programs in place, like widespread testing? Is there going to be a new normal? Will there be a vaccine? Will there be, you know, medicine that will treat this vaccine? But the thing that we must also remember is, during this time, there's so, there's so much information, a lot of information, a lot of information, contradictory, misinformation, so it can lead to decision-making paralysis and confusion. So as you, you think that maybe you should do it this way and yet you shouldn't do it this way, et cetera, so you're confused. Also, fraud has become a major, major concern. Many con men are taking advantage of this crisis. See what you read, see what you read. Look only to those robust news outlets and focus on those. There's a lot of fake news out there. The other thing that's going to come out of this is that there's going to be a lot of online adv advising. You know, like I said, counseling is going to be online now. Remote working, fintech is going to become more prominent in these years. In these, in these years, do we have access to it? How do we get access to it? You know, we have to begin, begin to use these platforms. Financial firms and advisors are going to be extremely busy in this. Because they're continually communicating to their clients to allow so you know, reach out for emotional health support, financial support, guidance, you know. So I, I'm just as I'm finishing now, the challenge now is how to balance genuine needs for some pre-retirement liquidity and provide adequate income past retirement for individuals. The need for pre-requirement liquidity often arises, of course, short-term emergency saving, indebtedness, and extreme situations like now. So lockdown means that people are not able to receive sustained and inadequate retirement income. Even in interrupting retirement funds for housing, this can leave people asset rich, but like what happens in the Singapore system. So if the loan is not paid back, the individual has put both their home and their retirement savings at risk. You know, even in systems without such a direct early access link. Risks to retirement savings can flow through indirectly, for example, contribution holidays, which fund debt return, et cetera. So at the end of the day, this crisis, how prepared you are financially for shock, say for retirement too. So conclusively, I would say again, and I cannot stress it enough, speak to your financial advisor now, start planning and saving now. The best day to save, as we know, was yesterday. This day is today. I'd encourage individuals, families, you know, with questions on this, of course, to reach out. Even with the continued market volatility, people will have time to be able to talk to you. This is a bad situation, and they've been training for this. So I think uh, we need to reach out. Lastly, as Apollo said, your children are not your retirement. That is where I'd like to stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosemary. Your children are not your retirement. Yes, we, we do have actually a comment from Olivia, who is saying very insightful presentation. Thank you, Rosemary. And we do have a question from Nelson. He says, Rosemary versus personal finance planning. Emergency fund planning versus personal finance planning. Um, I don't get the question. Sorry, I, I missed that. Okay, um, he says you share your comments on emergency fund planning versus personal finance planning. Yes. Are they two the same? Are they no. different? Emergency finance planning, of course, is incorporated into your financial plan. But I would look at emergency financial plan as a short term part because financial planning has got two parts long term and short term so look at the emergency one as a short term one so you need to actually have emergency funds as part of your financial plan include your emergency fund planning okay. so it's just included it's then, not, it's, they're not different it is just included then david lambert says great tips rosemary then we did receive a new email from Albert Mulele asking, when is the right time to access pension funds at retirement? When is the right time to access pension? 
funds as retirement. I would say that you go with the retirement age that is funds that is applicable to you. You'd go with the retirement age applicable to you. For example, what is the retirement age in NSSF? You'd go with the retirement age that is uh, the one for NSSF. But then everything, I mean, for, for example, PSPA for the Uganda Parliamentary Pension Plan are different. Your employer provident fund or gratuity fund will be different. So you go with the, with the full retirement age that has been given to you by your retirement fund provider, by your retirement fund. Okay, thank you for those responses, uh, Rosemary, and for the very insightful very session. Um, I think we'll have more questions coming in, and what we can do is at the end of this presentation, we will send you the video recording and also the presentation, the slides, and we'll send you the contacts to the panelists in case you need more clarification or information from them, then you can reach out to them afterwards. Now I'll, in I'll invite Lydia. Um, she tells me she has a lot of um, internet bundles that she's itching to give away. So Lydia, take it up. Okay, thank you so much. Up to this far, our speakers have been uh, very fantastic. The message is very consistent, planning and saving. But right before I ask the next question, perhaps I would love to ask a question that anyone can participate in, including the panelists, yeah? We say so many times that knowledge is power. Is that necessarily true? Anyone can answer that question. Knowledge is power. Is that a true statement? Uh, I see Hajat and Dora and Max have raised their hands. Maybe they can answer. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm seeing somebody has, um, has sent to the task box that yes, knowledge is a uh, power. Mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps I'd love to challenge um, all our audience and everyone here that knowledge is only power when it is applied. So try one of the things that you've had one of our speakers mention. Try looking for a financial advisor or even try saving today. And um, Enmos would be a good place to start with that. You can talk to us, you can send us emails, call us. So the second question that I'm, um, I'm going to um, share with us, I'm going to ask, uh, what services does Enwealth Uganda offer? So three people to hit the answer, to raise up their hands and to get that correctly. You have um, airtime for today. Patrick, I see you raise your hand. Caroline and Abraham. Please unmute Hi. your speaker. Pat yes, Patrick. Uh, thanks a lot for the uh, for organizing this. Uh, I'm really glad I joined in. Mm -hmm. uh, Enwealth is basically an administration, an administrator okay. for pension okay. services, universities, and uh, all that. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick. Caroline. Yeah. Caroline, are you there? Caroline, Farouk, and Abraham. One of you can go ahead. So, hello, this is Farouk now. Uh, N Wealth is a. Uh, hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah, he's a pension, uh, pension service provider. He looks up, uh, up to, to, to people's pension uh, investments and uh, all that. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you, Farouk. Thank you. All right. Caroline, Abraham, uh, any one of you online? Then I'll allow Martin, if none of them is around Martin. Do we have a third person? Martin or Gift yes. Sylvia? Yes, okay, go ahead, Martin. I'm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, maybe it start with a disclaimer. If I get the airtime, I'll give it to Brian. Uh, well, annual <laughs> financial services, of course, in addition to them simply being known to the administrators, mm -hmm. they have uh, an umbrella scheme. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, a bit about the umbrella scheme is that mm -hmm. uh, it runs an individual pension, pension plan kind of arrangement where, where a member can enroll as an individual. 
Thank wow. you. Mm -hmm. That's a great oh, answer, wow. Martin. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Martin. And uh, um, and Abraham and also Patrick and Caroline for mm -hmm. attempting that question. None Hello. Of Hello. Yes, Caroline. Uh, NWALS uh, provides uh, different um, products. There's uh, pension mm -hmm. yes. for individual members, and mm -hmm. then there's corporate pension, mm -hmm. and then you do also insurance mm -hmm. for individuals, and then corporate, and then also you provide training. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So I think we have four correct answers from Patrick, Farouk, Martin, yeah. and Caroline. Both all of mm -hmm. you have, have said something that's correct. Predominantly, mm -hmm. we are a pension administrator. Uh, yes, we do have the umbrella for corporates and individuals. We also offer training. We have an insurance uh, brokerage arm and an income drawdown uh, for people who are approaching retirement. Um, so I think okay. Lydia will be, please send us your phone number using the chat yes. function or the Q&A mm -hmm. function, and then we'll send you your airtime. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Over to you, Bansi. Thank you, and I'll hand over to Brian. Okay. Um, thank you, Bansi. Thank you, Lydia. Okay, now it's time for the last presenter. Emmanuel Mwaka. Uh, Emmanuel Mwaka is an executive director at the ICA Asset Managers with over 10 years experience. He chairs the Finance and Life Pensions Committee at Uganda Insurers Association. He holds a bachelor's degree uh, of development economics with Makere University. He's currently pursuing an MBA from Edinburgh Business School, amongst other professional pursuits. Emmanuel, you're welcome. Speak to us about early access on investments, impacts of early access on investments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, and good morning, fellow panelists, and to our viewers and listeners out there. Um, sorry for the technical glitch I had earlier on. Um, I hope I'll make amends, but I'm also very happy that I had um, a sort of hand of God to help me listen in as well to Rosemary first and learn a few tips, which I'll now dive into. Um, so mine is going to be very short um, and it's really going to dive deep into what the impact of early access on short and long term investments is and um, how best, you know, as, um, as savers, as players in this market space, um, we need to which insights we need to actually take and um, hold close to our chests. Um, of course, at the time like this, you know, they always say that you have to prepare for that rainy day. But when that rainy day comes, you do not know um, whether to come with hailstones, whether to bring flooding, like Rosemary alluded to Lake Victoria. You really do not know what, um, what, um, how big for how long it will actually last. And I think that's the um, situation that we're in right now. But ideally, um, from where we sit as fund managers, when you understand the details, it's easier for you to see the bigger picture. And that is what we all need to focus on. Um, we need to have facts. We need to know what's going on, um, how far we'll go with this, how long it will last. And these facts, of course, um, must be factual, if I'm to um, reuse the same word. And as we very well should understand, facts debunk myths. Um, and Basically, the, the discussions that we are having now, and I think one of the questions that I have to tackle is specifically speaking of, um, in light of the early access, um, the calls for early access to the 20% um, funds that we have with NSF, um, you know, how would that affect the pensions sector? But I would want to start from an analogy that um, I had many years ago and holds to today. A gentleman was at work and um, he quarreled with his boss. He was angry, but he could not do anything to his boss. So what he did, he went back home, took his anger home, um, kicked his, um, kicked his, he kicked his, uh, he kicked, um, sorry, he quarreled with his wife. His wife passed on the anger to the maid. The maid went and kicked the chicken they had in the house. Um, and before long, the chicken, um, 
died and the next morning there was no egg for breakfast. Basically, they, um, the gentleman just kicked the can down the road without really dealing with the issue that he had at hand, which issue should have been addressed with his boss. And in the current situation that we're in, the bigger dilemma really which I want to pose right now is basically how will businesses recover? Um, when will we fully return to work? Um, and what comes next and how prepared are we for this? Um, Rosemary talked quite well about savings and how we actually must um, take mind of our financial status. And it's critical that that is one of the things that we do on a time time basis. I also want to um, reiterate that ultimately in these situations that we are in, it's important for us to look at the statistics. The statistics talk of something totally different. Yes, I know and I've seen a lot of comments about the access to um, at least 20% from the um, NSF, but when you look at the numbers, you actually realize that this possibly um, is um, a white elephant because what impact will it actually have on the servers? We already have a very, very, very low number of the employed workforce or those that are of um, mature age who are actually serving with the fund. And you can see that the numbers are really, um, I should say, very depressing. To only have, say, 100,000 savers um, who have above 50 million. But really, the, the bigger statistic really is on the overall number of active um, savers who have saved at least once, who have sent in a contribution at least once during the course of one year. That is very glaring and telling us to the bigger problem that we have, which is a saving culture. We do not have a saving culture to talk of. And so even looking at NSF specifically and the pension sector during this period in time is, I would say, pointing your gun at the wrong target because it will not have any viable impact. Um, and most likely, anyway, the people that would, that have the, the um, who have been saving through the mandatory saving and even through the, the um, discretionary ones, the provident schemes are too few, and that in itself will not even cause any significant change in the livelihoods of those that would access those funds. I would, I'll come back to that shortly, but I'll go to um, specifically when you look at the asset distribution, and this really ties in with the slides that were presented by Apollo. You notice that um, most or virtually about 75% of the portfolios that the um, pension sector has is invested in, in government security. Then you have about 16% in equities, ETC. Now, retirement. Schemes are primary um, long-term investment vehicles because of the nature. You know, you save for 20 years of work and um, between 20, possibly to 30 years of work be before you can access your, um, your funds. And these are linked really to guard retirement, to avoid old age property, old age poverty. And it's important that um, if we can protect this, those that have this must endeavor to protect this as much as they can. Without a doubt, um, COVID-19 is here to stay. We will most probably get used to it like any other disease that has been killing us. We will get used to it. And it's really how we react to it now that will determine what the future holds for us. And um, of course, if you're to look at the numbers, and this also ties in with what um, they, MD of the fund shared liquidating investments, mostly long term in the short term, um, is quite tricky. It will bring in losses here and there, but that really for me is not the point. Um, really, when we talk about pension, we usually look at long term. When you have short term investments, these really refer to investments in in um, investment vehicles that can return cash within a period, of, say one year. That is short term. Um, long term, you know, you're extending above the horizon of three years going forward. Going forward. So it's, um, in a way, I would say that early access now, just because of COVID-19, is the premature um, thought, and we need to sort of deal with the bigger problem, which is how best do we actually um, kick the economy back into action? 
how best do we make sure that those that have lost jobs, those, those that have been followed now, how best do we ensure that these people can actually come back in? It's good that the pension sector actually invests already or uh, majorly in government securities. This, in a way, is already a contribution that the pension um, industry is giving to the government to actually use its weight to then provide the stimulus that we all need, that we all crave for our sector, um, for, sorry, for the economy at large. I would say that um, right now, as, as we speak, we've seen lots of um, employers um, terminating staff, declaring them redundant, and as um, private pension scheme managers, we've seen lots of requests for um, payment of benefits. Now, this in itself is a challenge from a liquidity management perspective, but in a way as well is um, an advantage if you are liquid enough. As the Bible says, those that have will always get more. So right now is a time when if you are liquid enough, as um, if your fund, if you're a trustee and you know your fund is liquid enough, you need to reach out to your fund manager and ask them that, you know, um, we know that, yes, these are times of distress, but if there are people who are exiting their positions um, at a discount, we want to be sure that you will actually take advantage of that and invest for us. Of course, there's also a, the drop in um, share prices, the general undervaluation, and this really is in sync with the slowdown in economic activity. But just like they also say, whatever comes, whatever goes down will surely rise up at some point. And for the pension sector specifically, since we are long term, we see into the future, this is where we need to actually assess businesses for their core value and check which ones are actually undervalued and then make sure that we actually vote with um, our feet in placing funds in those businesses because we know as um, sure as the sun rises every day that they will actually come up at some point. And at that point when they come up, we should be taking advantage on behalf of the savers on behalf of the pension scheme clients that we have on our books. Um, I would go on to, to state that the, the, um, from the issue of liquidity, um, pension schemes now have the added um, headache of balancing out, making sure that you do not then um, fall victim to yourself, so to speak, in um, exiting positions at a very low price that then does not, that makes you lose value um, that you would have ordinarily added to your members. So that in itself is something that needs to, to be taken care of um, by fund managers and trustees in, um, in executing their mandates. Now, they, they, they have talked a bit about the impact of COVID-19 on investment opportunities. Um, specifically speaking, the, the right now, when the economies are in distress world over, um, it typically means that if you have money, if you have liquid assets, this is a time when you really would say that cash is king. And the, the cash is king only for investment purposes, not for consumption purposes. Because as you can tell, um, when you go to the market, your typical um, basket size um, will be the same, but you might be paying about 30% um, higher for the same goods that you used to buy much earlier, save for eggs, of course. But every other thing else, because um, farmers don't have access, easy access to, to their markets, um, they, they, everything has gone up. So it's important that if you have liquidity, talk to your fund manager now and tell them that you know what, I do have assets that I think I want to take advantage of this downtown in the economy now and um, kindly help me um, be able to make the right decision. And I'm very sure that you'll actually take advantage of this difficult time for most of the rest of us. Now, I would say that the, the, um, as a participant in the pensions, in the pension space, it's very critical that we take advantage or we basically take advantage of this moment to show the relevance of the pension sector in giving that basket, in providing that security that we preach. Um, you know, we preach that, um, you know, put aside some money for that rainy day. 
And I think it's high time that pension and provident funds do what they can to mitigate the financial hardship experienced by those of their members still employed, but as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic are not earning their normal remuneration. This is important because it's basically preaching and it's a tool that we should use as, um, as pension fund administrators, um, as fund managers, as the industry to show the actual relevance of saving because ultimately um, retirement is only applicable when you've saved. If you have not saved all through your working life, all through your productive years, then there is no retirement to actually talk about. So it's important that um, we go back to the drawing board. And this, of course, um, really, I would say that the proverbial chicken that was kicked comes in here. And um, it's really not the, the pension fund players um, to come in and say, we will offer this. I think this goes back to the, to the um, framers of the, the laws. It's important that the laws, and I hope we, the next time we hear the president speak, he will talk about the stimulus package that has been um, created to help the economy come up. And hopefully that will be um, you know, akin to what we've seen the, um, some governments do and what we've also seen like um, the funds that we recently received from IMF. It's important that we actually see that the government is actually taking steps to bring the economy back on track. And some of these steps may involve the pension funds, you know, um, possibly offering something small. I would, in a way, support that in the, in the event that it's actually guided. It cannot be a blanket decision that, you know, all savers get 20%. I think it's just the same way that the banks have done to say that, you know, we'll give um, loan repayment relief to those that can demonstrate that they've actually been impacted negatively by COVID-19. I think it's something that as players, we can also play a part in. Um, ultimately, the, the, I believe that it will be a very small section of savers who have actually been negatively impacted. And um, I'm a strong believer in uh, Keynesian economics, um, and specifically this is about the multiplier effect, um, which really talks about an economic factor that when increased or changed causes or increases um, many other related economic variables. If people lose jobs now, that means that, you know, their purchasing power has dropped. Well said. Um, most of us have not been saving. This could be the wake up call that we all need to know that we actually must make sure we keep that, that small thing. In my language, they say, it is there. You know, that, that, that small kitty, when you harvest, um, you know, 10 bags of maize, you keep that one bag that you then use to plant seeds again next time. The rest you can eat, but you must always keep that, that, that small portion. So I would want to end by saying that the, the mandate right now, the attention is unfairly on the pension sector. But I believe that the government must play a key role in stimulating the economy. And it can only do this through um, making the right laws, the statutory um, instruments that can help us, even as pension fund players, actually play within that same space. We have already invested quite heavily in the government, and we believe it's the, it's the owners of the government to actually use this to spur back the economy so that people do not lose jobs, so that the saving culture is also enhanced further, and we will become prosperous again. As I said much earlier, COVID-19 is not here to stay. It will soon end, and when it ends, I do believe that um, those that have saved will actually be smiling more than those that have eaten into their savings for the future. Um, I ended by saying TGE, which is uh, loosely translated as Tusawa Government in Yambi. Um, so I want to beg um, to close my presentation there. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Emmanuel.
Number two, what advice would you give to trustees managing pension schemes? What advice would you give to trustees managing pension schemes in regard to preparedness of market crashing? Brian, I missed your first question. Okay, the first question is what will happen to pensions to pension in the event that the market crashes? I believe this is because of COVID-19. So what will happen to pension funds? Number two, what advice do you give trustees in preparations for the unlikely event that pension, the market crash? Yes. Thank you very much for those two questions. I think they, they, we need to redefine what the market is and what a market crash actually is. Um, Typically speaking, the, the laws that govern the investment vehicles that pension schemes um, invest in specifically address the risk of market crashes. So you would not, in a, in a way, have markets crashing all across the board. I know um, in one of our neighboring countries, I've had talk that the government would want to um, default on payments of um, pension fund interest, which would be a very big, a very bad precedent to, um, to risk management, but I would say that as pension fund managers, we, our key mandate really is to manage risk. And manage risk comes in with how we allocate the portfolios and specifically on a day-to-day -day basis, manage the, the performance of those portfolios. I'll give an example. If, uh, if we have the largest proportion of investments in government securities, the, the, the ultimate crash of all crashes would be if the government is unable to actually pay. But um, from time immemorial, we've always had this, this, um, this breach, and we hope it's still true. We will continue to pray that it, it will still be true, but the government will never default. And I think that is our leverage, because if you have 75% of your investment value in, um, in a security that you believe will not crash, then you've pretty much protected yourself against the um, likely impact of uh, a collapse in the market. Because at the bare minimum, we know that the government can actually print money. Of course, the inflationary um, implications thereafter is a discussion for another day. I think the second one on the advice for trustees in regard to question for market crashes, I think this is the time when trustees require um, as frequent information from the fund managers as possible. Basically highlighting where the investments are, um, what investment decisions are being taken during this crisis and how they've been, and how they've been informed. Um, because it's different to say that you're a trustee of a scheme and you do not actually know what the fund manager is doing about with the funds that you provided. But it's critical as well that um, the trustees possibly ask for worst case scenarios from their fund managers to just check that, you know, if the market is to crash, if we are to uh, lose out on all our securities, um, the, the um, equities, what will happen? You know, how bad will it look for us as the trustees of the scheme? And those stress tests are critical. Um, I'm very certain as well that there are certain insurance products that might not have made their way yet into this market that ideally come into play to um, cater for market crashes. Um, as Uganda, I've not heard of one being offered yet because we have not yet reached that level, but I'm sure with people like Rosemary, um, these are some of the things that can come in very handy. Okay. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for the very insightful presentation. Um, I can see you've even... Um, gotten a few converts. Isaiah here on the chat session says that after your presentation, um, he's less inclined to support the 20% NSSF cash out, maybe 5 to 10% for the people who really need it. So thank you for that. Um, I will invite our CEO and Managing Director, Mr. Simon Afuba, to just speak briefly uh, before we wrap it up. Um, Simon has been in this industry for the last uh, 15 years, and he brings a wealth of experience in retirement. Uh, benefits, structuring, and um, policy formulation. So, Simon, over to you. 
Uh, thank you, Bansi. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, so ideally, uh, what we are required to have is that the first phase of life is called capital accumulation. So you accumulate, but even as you accumulate your assets for retirement, we normally would encourage don't save everything. Save while also you have a portion of the money, you enjoy part of the money. So life is not a rehearsal, you're already living. Part of the money, enjoy it, eat well, take care of yourself, while the balance you are saving, accumulating some level of fallback, financial fallback, <coughs> at the point of retirement, you use what you have accumulated. We call it the um, decumulation phase. So the first phase is accumulation, and then the second phase of it is called the decumulation phase. If you have not accumulated anything, by the time you get to retirement, there will be nothing to decumulate. And regrettably, you might decumulate yourself. So it is imperative at this point, COVID-19, we, we take heed of the, the advices from Rosemary, from Apollo, from our, uh, the CEO, uh, ICA, and, and act on the information that we are getting. Now, for you to be able to accumulate a, a stable financial future, the starting point is to have depth of understanding of yourself. Um, because at any point in life, you always will have three kinds of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who things happen to. Now, the gainers in all these three scenarios are those who make things happen. Even if they may not have immediate gain of financial opportunities, the world of experiences that they gain through the um, experiences that they go through builds inner resilience and positions them in a much more stronger position to weather through any next, God forbid, COVID-19 pandemic or, uh, or any other version of any challenge in life that would come. And so there is no safety in playing safe. Um, it's imperative to also appreciate that. And so maybe in this season, I do challenge those who are listening to us, try and do your personal SWOT analysis from a financial perspective. Um, you look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your threats, your, your, your opportunities, and then develop some short-term goals, medium-term goals like Rosemary Guided and long-term goals in response to your strength in, in response to your financial weaknesses, in response to your threats, and also in response to the opportunities, because opportunities you do not make use of, you don't gain from them. Um, and after having that, of course, that is, uh, I call it you sense. You sense by identifying, you analyze. And then you respond by measuring and acting in a, in a, uh, for each of those particular ob objectives that you'll have set up. And then also, um, financial sustainability has to do with building your income ability. And there are three levels of income ability. Income ability number one is you can actually earn income as an employee or a business owner. Whichever category it is, as an employee, it means you need to be a resource you need to have a requisite skill and competency that can attract value in the market, in the job market, so that you can now exchange your resource as a skill uh, to solve problems in the society, and then in exchange you get salary. Um, as a business, it means you have to have scalability. The right product with the right, or a service or product with the right human cap 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 capital, a requisite cap ca human capital and also then the infrastructural ability to deliver the service of the product. But when money comes, if you cannot, the first threat to your money is you. It's your behavioral you. <laughs> Actually, financial freedom is only 20% knowledge and 80% your behavior. How you behave and respond to the money. As a matter of fact, that people, when they have money, you can always tell because they can't sit even on their seat. It's like there is heat on their seat. They become extremely restless. You only know that they, are, they don't have money when they are available, easily available, 
on call and any other <laughs> channels of, <laughs> of reaching them. Now, the, fa the last one is even when you have money, do you have requisite knowledge to grow that money? And that has to do with savings and financial knowledge and risk management. And even knowing the times to invest is called discernment of time and risk. And I close with this, according to World Economic Forum report in 2020, almost 42% of the skills we have has to be reskilled. Otherwise, by the year 2030, they will fall off. I want to use this analogy. Um, if you were a phone, 30, 20, sorry, 20, a mobile phone 20 years ago, a mobile phone, you could only um, call. That's it. And you had to search network, uh, phones like Ericsson or Alcatel. But right now, if you are a mobile phone, you can do email, you can do mobile money, you can Google, you can do Zoom, you can do a lot of things. Now, can you imagine if you had the same mobile phone 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Look at the treatments. What happens is that if you are that same mobile phone, you probably will just be used in the village on a please call me basis, contractual terms. And you know that is not a very easy one. But if you are an iPhone, uh, like the ones Apollo uses, <laughs> um, first you have a cover, you are protected. If you are lost, we have to insure you. We have to look for you. That is how resourceful you are. I challenge us to review our skill set to remain sustainable in a changing economic environment in a way that we can sustainably build our income abilities uh, to be able to build our future uh, financial sustainability. I just want to close with this because of time. The world may not, the world may be locked down, but heaven is not. So we can pray out of this situation. There is hope in the land of the living. The sun will rise again. So don't lose hope. Thank you. I stop there. Thank you so much, Simon. Yes, we will not lose hope. Um, I want to invite my colleague Lydia to engage us for the last time and share the bundles. Okay. Uh, hello, it's me again. Mm -hmm. I know you're seeing me and you're literally seeing airtime, but that's correct because you're going to get airtime again. Um, so I haven't received the numbers of two participants from the previous round that we did. That is Patrick and Martin. Please send your numbers to the chat box and then we'll be able to get it and then you'll be able to get your, your airtime. So the last question that I'm going to ask has no right answer. It has no wrong answer. It just depends with... Um, you, it depends on you and every answer is absolutely correct. So I'm going to ask, what do you love most about NWALF? What do you love most about NWALF? So the first three hands to go up can tell us at least one thing or two or three things that they love about NWALF. Okay, I have Hajat, Rajab, Vivian and Dora. Mm -hmm. Can I go first? Can I go first? Yes, okay, let's, let Hajab go yeah. first, then Rajab. Hello, how are you? How are you? You're fine. Yes, good um, I love N Wealth because of the, um, now keeping us alert during these mm -hmm. difficult times. Uh, there are many things I love about them, but keeping us alert with these webinars, that is the key. So I leave my colleagues to give other answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Can I come on? Yes, Roger. Hello. Yes, Roger. Can I, get, can I come through? Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, the reason I like animals is that uh, in a country that we're living in, we have problems of financial literacy. So many of us live hand to mouth 
and that doesn't even depend on how much you earn. There are people that earn very low, then there are people that earn subject to the earn, they earn very high amounts of money, but they still live hand to mouth. We are only as rich as our next paycheck. Such that you find someone earning millions, but in just a week after earning those millions, they are begging. So with institutions like um, Enwilf, we have opportunities to learn how to better use our money, how to save for the times that are uncertain in the future, and how to be financially independent. We don't have to depend on, help me with some money. Help, here we call it some come money, some come money. So with the end of the services that they provide, we shift from that into financial disparity. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Rajab. Hi, this is Vivian. Can I go next? Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. Uh, what I love about NWAP, first of all, would be the friendly staff, Bansi and Brian. Um, I have worked with Brian before, so I know he's really friendly. And also the diversity of the knowledge that we've been given. If someone, if any of us has followed through in the different webinars, um, both in Uganda and Kenya, you know that NWAP has been able to tackle a number of issues. And so it gives us diversity in the knowledge that we're able to get during these times. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, you can send us your contacts on the chat box and then we will be able to send you the airtime. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Nangila Wamalwa. Thank you, Bansi, over to you. All right, thank you, Lydia. I think Dora also wanted to share something. Dora, if you may go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, what I love about Enwealth, well, my boss is here. Emma, hi. <laughs> but uh, what I love about Enwealth is the MD. He's amazing. I think he's, 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 he's such an excellent leader. I have had chance to be in his training several times, and he never leaves me the same. He's got a lot and lots of wisdom. And then I love the fact that he's always and always rooted in God. Actually, we in the same industry, I fear him now that he's in Uganda, but we'll take him on. <laughs> we'll, we'll grow the industry. It's Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dora, and all the other uh, participants for sharing your feedback. Really, for us, it's an honor and privilege to serve you. And I'll invite Brian, who will just share something very brief on some of the services we offer, in case you didn't know, and then we'll wrap it up. Brian? Brian, can you hear us? We can't hear you, Brian. Um, are you? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. All right, just a quick one. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Just a quick um, round about who Enwealth is. Uh, Enwealth, our vision is to offer you a dignified retirement for everyone. So we go into the debate of dignified, but we give you that dignified retirement, and that's what we want to see for you. And we do this by innovative, so by offering innovative social security financial services. Now, in our service offering, we have the following pillars. We are innovative in our product offerings. We strive for excellence, do it right the first time. And also, we don't just serve, but we also do it with fun. We take pleasure and we do it with passion as we render our service to our customers. Now, there is the Steve Covey trust philosophy. When trust is high, then you spend less energy in offering service. And we do that, we offer it with, to earn trust from our customers and deliver value to them. Now our structure of NWOS, we are operational. I think that question should have come to Lydia. 
uh, we are operational in Kenya, Uganda, and Mauritius. And uh, all throughout our areas of operation, the organization remains the same name, NWealth Financial Services. And we're able to serve you through our different areas of reach. We have been in existence for 10 years as an organization. We have a total capacity of 40 technical staff in different areas. We have in pension administration, legal team, the training department, all 40 technical staff. We administer $620 million of assets under administration. We have a professional indemnity cover of $1 million uh, US dollars, and we administer over 50 lives, 50,000 lives. Some of the services we offer are fund administration, as spoken about here. Uh, this we administer schemes. We also do consultancy services in terms of schemes merger, schemes setup, schemes wind down. We also offer trainings, insurance brokerage, corporate trustee services, and also there's a special arm for property. Then our products, we have uh, income drawdown products. This is where really um, you're able to receive your money on a monthly, on a quarterly, on a biannual, or, an, or as you choose, really. So as opposed to taking your money lump sum, we can pay you on a period that you choose. There's the annual personal pension fund where individuals in the formal sector, consultants are able to save. We also have the diaspora fund for people who are abroad and also the umbrella fund for corporate organizations. We also have a post-retirement medical fund whereby people at their retiree years after retirement, they are still able to access medical benefits so that they spend their money on other things than on medical benefits, than medical expenses. If you want to reach us, we are located at Nakawa House, UAP Business Park. Our numbers are indicated on the screen at nwc.ug. Our website is also available for information concerning our product and how we can be able to help to you. Um, I think we've lost Brian, but he was um, basically thanking you. And uh, I'd want to reiterate that we are very glad that you, you were able to join us for this webinar. We apologize that we've gone um, overboard with a few minutes, uh, but we trust that the session has been very uh, helpful to you and your respective schemes. I want to thank the speakers, Mr. Emmanuel, Apollo, and Rosemary for joining us today and sharing your insights. We truly do appreciate so we will wrap it up here and uh, we hope to engage with you in the near future when we have a new, an, another webinar. At the end of this webinar, once I end it, you will receive a questionnaire. Kindly give us your feedback so that we can know how to improve and even share with us topics that you want to, to, for us to present on in the future. Thank you and God bless you. Have a great day ahead. Bye. Bye.